Welcome to the global conference call of Mercedes-Benz. At our customers' request, this conference will be recorded. The replay of the conference call will also be available as an on-demand audio webcast in the Investor Relations section of the Mercedes-Benz website. This short introduction will be directly followed by a Q&A session. If you have difficulties during the conference, please press zero and the hash key on your telephone keypad for operator assistance. If you want to ask a question after the presentation, please press nine star on your telephone keypad and you will receive a confirmation that you are now in the queue. To remove the question, please press again nine star on your telephone keypad and you will hear a noise which confirms the removal from this queue. Please note that dialing nine star a second time during the call will automatically withdraw your question. Please refrain from pressing the key combination multiple times during the call. I would like to remind you that this telephone conference is governed by the safe harbor wording that you will find in our published results documents. Please note that our presentations contain forward-looking statements that reflect management's current views with respect to future events. Such statements are subject to many risks and uncertainties. If the assumptions underlying any of these statements prove incorrect, then actual results may be materially different from those expressed or implied by such statements. Forward-looking statements speak only to the date on which they are made. May I now hand over to Steffen Hoffmann, Head of Mercedes-Benz Investor Relations and Treasury. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Steffen Hoffmann speaking on behalf of Mercedes-Benz. I'd like to welcome you on both the telephone and the Internet to our Q1 results conference call. I'm very happy to have with me today Harald Wilhelm, our CFO, to give you maximum time for your questions, Harold will begin with an introduction directly followed by a Q&A session. The respective presentation can be found on the Mercedes-Benz IR website. Now, I'd like to hand over to Harald. Yeah, thank you, Stefan, and uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to that Q1 call. Uh, well, if I look at, uh, I mean, this quarter, I would say this is a demanding quarter, looking at uh, market evolution, supply chain, product uh, transitioning. Therefore, I think it's important, I mean, that we all understand what are the temporary impacts in the quarter and what are the implications uh, for the full year, in particular, I mean, for the, for the guidance. Uh, with this being said, now let's have a look at the numbers at the group level, page uh, two. <clears throat> uh, obviously, lower car sales mean lead uh, to lower revenue. Uh, EBIT and uh, EPS. So the EPS reduction, however, is uh, smaller, lower than the EBIT reduction. Is uh, the in net income is less impacted, and we have the accretion effect from the share buyback on EPS. We delivered a solid cash flow of 2.2 billion. So you see, cash matters, and is in the focus, and uh, that supported uh, a very comfortable cash position, net cash position, with more than 33 billion by the end of the quarter. <clears throat> Before we turn uh, to the numbers of the first quarter in more detail, I would like to highlight you know, a few models, uh, products which came uh, into the market in, in uh, Q, Q1. I think this is also important to understand the Q1 sales and mixed evo evolution as uh, these products are going to hit the market in the, in the remainder of the year and obviously the time ahead of that. So what are they? Uh, <clears throat> first and uh, uh, foremost, I mean, uh, the all-new G cars on the ice. Next to it, uh, we have the electric uh, G-Class world premiere I mean, in the uh, U.S. and uh, China last week simultaneously. Uh, you might have seen that this comes along I mean, with unique driving functions like the G-turn, the G-steering, and uh, the intelligent off-road crawl functions. Well, what else? Uh, we saw an extensive upgrade of the EQS with more than 800 kilometers range. A new executive rear seats and a standing star in front of the, the hood, and uh, uh, lots of stuff on the AMG side with different um, E-Class variants of AMG, the 53, uh, further GT coupe variants uh, in the first uh, quarter. So uh, again, uh, these uh, products uh, will hit the market uh, in the remainder of the year, uh, which will help I mean sales, but in particular mix and much more to come in the quarters and in the time ahead of us. Uh, let's look at uh, the sales evolution, page four, a bit more in detail. Total sales at cars were at 463,000 units. 
uh, impacted by supply constraints, uh, product transitioning, and uh, market dynamics. So let's zoom a bit into the regional evolution. We could see basically a stable evolution in Europe and in the U.S. in the first quarter. If we zoom and deep dive a bit further into, into China, what happened here, the E-class availability was constrained in the first quarter. We also saw effects from the model year changeovers and the product launches. Uh, these uh, product introductions, as just mentioned before, will support, I mean, say, H2. And overall, we have seen uh, an, uh, a market weakness uh, in the first uh, quarter. Also, our top-end vehicle products uh, could not completely escape from that market weakness. If we look at uh, the sales evolution from a segment structure, uh, globally, we can say that uh, the first quarter was still constrained in terms of supply, but this is on the way to ease. The easing supply constraints had an immediate impact uh, on the GLC in particular, uh, which means uh, the core segment increased uh, by 8%. On the top-end vehicle side, this is comparatively lower than last year, uh, which was a pretty decent and high level. Uh, so the quarter one on the top end is a mixed bag of uh, product uh, transitioning with 67,000 units. Uh, we saw the impact from the model changeovers at the G-Class, the changeovers meaning in high-volume vehicles like the AMG E-Class and the GLCs, as well as supply chain uh, bottlenecks. Uh, in uh, the top end, as I just mentioned before, we also saw sales mean a bit lower, that also uh, uh, impacted me on the S-Class. However, S-Class remains the undisputed leader in all regions. Overall, we see that sales should improve over the quarters. The top-end mix uh, should also improve in H2 as well, um, uh, while we continue to take a cautious view on the market overall. If you look on the best side of things, in the first quarter, <coughs> the XEV share uh, is at the prior year level, with EQC and SMART reaching the end of uh, their life cycles uh, in uh, H1. We also see some slowdown in the EV adoption rate across the industry, and therefore we adapt our offerings uh, to it. In this period of uncertainty, uh, in terms of the EV transitioning, our top-notch uh, plugins can play an important role uh, in this uh, transitioning. Cars financials, uh, page five, revenues down in line with the volume, ASP at 75,000 euro, EBIT at uh, 2.3 adjusted, cash flow uh, CF bit at uh, 2.3. Let's go through the, the EBIT walk uh, in more detail on the page six. So the return on sales adjusted is at 9% in the first quarter. Uh, how did we get there? <clears throat> Number one, the bucket volume structure net pricing is down, uh, driven by the lower volume, the mixed impact as I outlined before, a net pricing which is in total positive, and additional measures, investments uh, into the product life cycle to keep the product at the cutting edge. Furthermore, we see in the bridge uh, FX negative due to the Turkish Lira, Whereas on the industrial performance side, we see a positive evolution. The main effects here are tailwinds from lower raw material prices and improved operational efficiencies, which uh, suggests that, we, that we're doing our homework in terms of the efficiencies. The R&D spend is uh, slightly below prior year level. Main effects in the other bucket uh, of minus 200 are the BBAC at equity result and uh, the absence of some prior year one-time effects. On the adjustment side, we see 133 million euro uh, upside related uh, to legal proceedings in the diesel. You might have heard the positive news for our company that the, the DOJ has closed the criminal inquiry into Mercedes-Benz related to diesel emissions in the United States. Here, yeah, I would like to point out that the 133 million results from various developments and assessments and may not necessarily relate only to one specific proceeding or case. With this all together, the EBIT is uh, booked is at 2.5, with the ROS at 9.6. <clears throat> Obviously, this is not I mean, the level where we want to be. 
Um, and uh, we'll talk later in terms of where we want it to, to be for quarter two and subsequent quarters. Uh, on the cash flow side, cars, uh, page seven, the safe bid is at 2.3 with a cash conversion at uh, one. Uh, light, slight tailwind from working capital at 0.3, more or less all, all in balanced. Net investments uh, are <coughs> in PPE and in intangible are lower than uh, the depreciation, which means that the investments uh, are prioritized and stringently managed. The other line includes adjustments of the BBC and equity result in the absence of a DV in the first quarter. So if you turn to the van side, uh, a strong start into the year with regards to sales driven uh, by the commercial vans, especially strong performance in, in the U.S. and in, in China. Uh, our <coughs> strong uh, product portfolio uh, uh, has been further supported with the launch of the new East printer and the mid-size vans. That uh, product substance and portfolio, the healthy mix, uh, robust uh, net pricing, and uh, price premium combined with efficiency measures, uh, all in all resulted in another quarter with uh, very good financial performance on the van side. <clears throat> At the same time, uh, obviously, we continue to prepare for van EA with a groundbreaking inventory being the latest example. Uh, Sales numbers on, on the land side, uh, total sales 7% up uh, in all regions. Uh, as I just said before, the mm, all new EV portfolio has been launched in the quarter one, uh, therefore not leaving traces in the quarter one yet, so uh, being available in the quarters uh, to come. And with this, uh, we obviously all expect also the EV share to increase with the new e-sprinter and the mid-size EQV and EV2 once they're fully available. Key numbers on the page 10 for vans, all, all figures up, revenues up in line with the volume, EBIT adjusted uh, up by 11% to $800 million, and uh, also the cash conversion up uh, by more than 50%. EBIT bridge on the page 11, <clears throat> uh, so return on sales adjusted at 16.3%. Where is it coming from? A uh, significant uh, tailwind uh, from the volume structure pricing uh, bucket with increased uh, volume with positive structure, healthy pricing supported by the product substance. On the industrial performance side, uh, we have a bit of a headwind from higher inflation and uh, supply chain related to cost. With all of this, I mean the EBIT adjusted is at 800 million. On the adjustment, same comment as for cars related uh, to legal proceedings and uh, diesel. <clears throat> on the cash flow side of vans, uh, the CF bit reported 0.6, adjusted 0.7, cash conversion 0.9, uh, moderate working capital uplift. Uh, the net investments uh, exceed uh, the depreciation, no surprise, as uh, we invest in our plans to make them ready for the recently announced models, as well as uh, the uh, van EA generation to come. On the other buckets, uh, same comment as on cars. On uh, mobility, <clears throat> um, what can we see here in terms of the highlights in the first quarter? New business I mean, remained at uh, the same level. We see uh, in China penetration rates uh, lower due to a significant uh, competition in the local banking sector. The, um, EVs, uh, the XEVs uh, see an increasing acquisition rates. Uh, mobility continues to support uh, the ramp up of uh, the EVs uh, with every second vehicle being supported uh, by MBM financing options. The profitability of the new acquisition, acquisitions continues uh, to improve. The increase in the cost of credit risk is mainly driven by the development in the U.S., and at the same time, we continue to develop them in our charging business uh, with more charging hubs uh, already being up and running in the first quarter. On page 14, uh, the key numbers, new business, as I just mentioned before, at the same level, portfolio also roughly same level uh, as at the year end, 2023. And for the EBIT, we look on the next page on the walk, page uh, 15, 
So as we guided uh, for in the, the uh, quarter one, which is said, I mean, uh, would be in single-digit territory, uh, that's what you can see here on the chart. How did we get there? Higher cost uh, of credit risk, mainly driven by the U.S. due to increased credit losses in the consumer segment, were one of the key drivers. Besides uh, the continued improved acquisition margin, we see a positive impact from the development of the portfolio versus in the first uh, quarter. However, the overall portfolio margin is still under pressure as it takes time for the improved acquisition margin to be reflected uh, in the portfolio. Um, at the same time, uh, we also see an uh, impact uh, from a bit lower remarketing results uh, at Atlon, and uh, we also included in these numbers uh, the investments uh, in terms of uh, the charging business um, for the first uh, quarter. With all of that, I mean this is at 8.5% return on equity. Group numbers, uh, page uh, 16. Uh, so cars, vans, mobility, I already explained, leaves the, the recon, the consolidation item. Uh, here, basically, we find the ad equity result uh, of the Daimler trucks with uh, a bit more than uh, 200 million included. The EBIT adjusted at uh, 3.6. After the adjustments I elaborated before, we see a group EBIT reported at 3.9. How did we turn that into, into cash? Page 17. Um, income taxes, uh, and obviously division evolution, been I explained already before. Income taxes um, at uh, minus 0.7, a bit lower. That's the usual seasonality. And uh, uh, we have a slightly negative uh, impact due to interest received, seasonal pension effect, and a bit of others in the recon items. All in all, I mean, a pretty strong cash flow at uh, 2.2 billion euro in the first quarter and uh, cash adjustments uh, of 90 million for legal proceedings related to diesel. Looking at uh, the nil evolution, page uh, 18. So end of the quarter, we see a comfortable 33.6 billion. Uh, that has been supported uh, by the cash flow obviously of 2.2 billion. Uh, at the same time, we bought back shares for around uh, 300 million. Let me update you shortly on the capital allocation, page uh, 19. On the chart, you see on the left-hand side uh, what we announced uh, in uh, February in terms of new, our new capital allocation framework. How do we implement it uh, now? In uh, May 2024, Right after the AGM, we will start with our already announced additional 3 billion euro share buyback program. From then onwards, and I think this is the piece of news here, um, both buyback programs, um, the remaining 4 billion and the new 3 billion, will run in parallel. They will be executed by an independent bank, which makes uh, its trading decisions obviously without influence by ourselves. As a milestone, we expect buybacks to reach a total of around 4 billion euro by quarter three this year. And uh, to finish uh, with a total share of buybacks up to 7 billion all in all uh, in first quarter uh, 2025 before the AGM. As of today, approximately 13 months after we started our initial share buyback, we have already acquired approximately 2.3 billion. This means in, in around I mean, 11 remaining months, we plan to buy back additional shares in the amount of up to 4.7 billion euro. Both share buybacks uh, will be executed through the stock exchange with the purpose of redeeming the shares at the end of the program before AGM 2025. As we said, we intend to ask for a renewal of the authorization for SPBs in our AGM in uh, 2025 to further continue share buybacks in line with the share buyback uh, policy. Uh, on, with any share buyback, we'll keep, however, flexibility on the execution in case of unexpected market developments. So let me sum, sum it up on this one here, I would say. Cash flow generation remains one of uh, the key focus topics of the company, as you can see with the cash flow in the first uh, quarter, and uh, capital allocation, uh, shareholder return, 
obviously uh, equally important to us. With this, uh, let's turn to the outlook uh, on uh, page uh, 21. For uh, the assumptions, uh, please read I mean, the chart carefully. What is written there in terms of economic, uh, uh, macroeconomic, uh, and global uncertainties. Uh, let's jump to the car side in uh, terms of uh, the <clears throat> uh, situation with regard to, to the supply. So we see that the current supply bottlenecks are on the way to ease on GLC and on E-Class and uh, are expected to, to improve uh, further. The Q1 is considered to mean to be the trough in terms of uh, the sales. Quarter two should be better al already. What does it mean for the sales guidance? Uh, total car unit sales we expect at prior year level with all new e cars and GLC expected to support the core segment development this year and the top end uh, vehicle uh, segment improving versus the first quarter level due to the product uh, transitioning, which I emphasized I mean before. Looking at uh, the regions in Europe overall, we see a sentiment uh, which is unchanged. The more detailed picture I mean, in Europe shows, however, a bit of a heterogeneous picture in the different uh, markets. Uh, with regard to China, uh, we do see the availability of products I mean, to improve, in particular on E-Class. Uh, here we see a very good product acceptance uh, for this one and, and uh, others, like I mean, the GLC. So from the product portfolio side and an availability perspective, we see growth potential. However, overall, in terms of market uh, assessment, I mean, for China, we remain a cautious perspective. On the U.S., we still see a solid momentum for sales and demand with a positive year-on-year -year development. Positive effects come in particular on the SUV side, and here I would mention the GLC. On the XEV share, we confirm the guidance at 19 to 21%. Be aware our consolidated uh, smart sales are running out since the new smart is not part of the reported sales figures anymore. On the adjusted return on sales cars guidance, uh, this is unchanged at uh, 10 to 12 uh, percent. So how do we want to get there uh, with the 9 percent in the first quarter? Well, we uh, do expect the volume to increase over the quarters. We clearly target the mix improvement in the second half of the year. We want to hold pricing and, uh, and defend it at the current levels. Uh, we clearly see raw materials improving further, generating further tailwinds. Um, uh, at the same time, we see supply chain-related uh, costs uh, uh, generating further, he further headwinds. However, all in all, material costs remain a net positive, i.e. a further tailwind. So with this, all in all, we confirm uh, 10 to 12 percent return on sales adjusted. Uh, in a continued demanding uh, environment. For PPE, R&D, cash conversion rate adjusted for cars, um, all unchanged. Uh, so with this, I would move uh, to the van side. So here the guidance is unchanged. We had a strong quarter one, as we walked through before. With uh, the start into the year, we um, have a comfortable, comfortable cushion, I mean, for the remainder of the year considering current macro developments and uncertainties with regard to H2, we stay rather prudent and confirm full year guidance at the 10 to, uh, 12 to 14 percent return on sales adjusted. We also expect a healthy uh, quarter two in terms of return on sales. Market demand is expected to be softening in private and commercial land side. Full year guidance um, on all the other KPIs are unchanged. On mobility, the uh, adjusted return on equity is uh, also unchanged in the range of uh, 10 to 12 percent for the full year. Uh, we see quarter one as uh, the trough uh, with improvements uh, in the second half of the year, uh, despite the further increase in the ramp-up costs of our charging infrastructure. 
so how do we get there from the 8.5% in the first quarter? Uh, positive effects uh, from the increased acquisition margins uh, translating into the portfolio, as I emphasized before, and some improvements in the cost of credit risk compared to quarter one. Uh, on the group guidances, uh, that follows page 22, follows the same premises as the segment uh, guidance. Uh, all group guidances, uh, KPIs uh, are uh, confirmed. Um, with this, I would uh, wrap it up here in terms of um, the summary, the takeaway from the first uh, quarter. So we clearly expect the volumes mean to come up. We do see quarter one as a trough. Uh, we have a great product lineup. Um, we talked about the top end vehicle products I mean to come into the market uh, in quarter two and uh, beyond. In particular, I mean, in age two, we see a, a strong uh, potential and momentum here from the products and further on in 2025, obviously. I emphasize uh, the G-Class, the GT, the, uh, the E-Class, uh, AMG versions, uh, the GLC, AMG versions, and uh, a lot of products to come in 2025 and, and beyond. At the same time, we stay flexible on the transitioning from ICE uh, to EVs uh, and um, uh, do our homework in terms of uh, efficiency while staying focused on the cash generation and uh, on capital allocation. With uh, this, uh, I would uh, uh, now be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Harald. Ladies and gentlemen, you may ask your questions now. I will identify the questioner by name. However, please also introduce yourself with your name and the name of the organization that you are representing before asking the question. Please ask your questions in English and please limit the number of questions to a maximum of two. Now, before we start, the operator will explain the procedure. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to ask a question after this presentation, please press 9 star on your telephone keypad and you will receive a confirmation that you are now in the queue. To remove the question, please press again 9 star on your telephone keypad and you will hear a noise which confirms the removal from the queue. Please note that dialing 9 star a second time during the call will automatically withdraw your question. Please refrain from pressing this key combination multiple times during the call. Again, for a question, please press 9 star on your telephone keypad now. If you have difficulties raising a question, please try another conference call telephone number indicated in the invitation you received or press 0 and the hash key on your telephone keypad for operator assistance. We start the Q&A and the first question goes to Tim Rokossa from Deutsche Bank. Yeah, good morning, gentlemen. Thank you. It's Tim from Deutsche Bank. Um, Harold, you have a number of things going for you. There's a really strong buyback now in parallel. The free cash flow remains strong. Nance is amazing. But obviously, the 9% cash margin is really tough to swallow this morning. And we knew that Q1 would be weaker. This is still weaker than most had anticipated. And you know how important this KPI is. So it is quite crucial for you guys to rebuild the story with this very strong decline that we have now seen for multiple quarters in a row. You say that Q1 was the trough. Will Q2 already see a material turning point for the cost margin? Will it be above 10%? Or is this sort of like a slow transition into the second half? And we have to wait for that time to really see this. Secondly, this is a pretty busy auto morning. You see a couple of consistent themes from the reporting. Um, pricing seems to hold up very well in the mass market as well as in the premium market. Mix is not great, and volume seems to be quite weak for everyone. On the positive side, that tells us the industry remains very price disciplined. We wanted that. It's good. But at the same time, it is quite curious why everyone really struggles on the volume side and talks about product availability being an issue and a lot better volumes to come in H2. Can that really be the case? And what are you preparing in terms of pricing for if everyone really needs to make up a lot of volume with all the newly available models launched in H2? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Tim. <clears throat> uh, so on the first question, uh, how do we exit from the 9% ASAP? Uh, I can say very clearly, I mean, I'm not happy with the 9% in the first quarter. Uh, very, very clear. And that's, I mean, uh, there's a, a lot of emphasis on um, uh, getting out of that territory 
uh, as quickly as we can. What do we expect to happen in, this, in the second quarter without giving, I mean, a detailed guidance now for the quarter? Uh, but uh, clearly, I mean, we target, I mean, volume higher in the second quarter than in Q1. That's why I did say before that quarter one is, is a trough. Uh, I do see that on the material cost, in particular on raw metals, I mean, uh, there, there should be further tailwind, I mean, in the second quarter. I think that gives opportunity to improve in the, in the second quarter uh, already. Uh, and uh, clearly, I mean, I would have the ambition that we see a double digit again in, in the second uh, quarter, uh, whereas, I mean, the mix improvements uh, rather kicks in, in, the, in the second half of the year uh, in terms of top-end vehicle availability and further ramp up uh, given the, the supply constraints. So um, uh, that should be a trajectory, I mean, to get to the full year guidance of uh, 10 uh, to, uh, to 12%. Uh, in terms of your second question, um, uh, so much stuff to come. Uh, I have a bit of a different perspective, if I may say. Uh, you could see uh, the high level of uh, yeah, demand materializing on GLC, GLC availability, with 8% up in the, in the first quarter. Uh, on the core, driven by the GLC. What, what is my message here? Uh, these products are in high demand. So it's a product substance which is driven, is, which, is, uh, which drives the market, the dynamics. And we see exactly, I mean, the same uh, market feedback demand on the E-Class. Uh, also in China, uh, we were constrained also in other overseas markets, in particular in South Korea. Um, so once the products are now available in these markets, uh, we really see in the demand for customers uh, for it with healthy pricing level. Um, we stay competitive, uh, but uh, the pricing levels on the products mean uh, are healthy. Uh, I commented before are stable. So as we discussed, I think uh, at uh, earlier occasions, I mean the heat is rather on on the EV pricing. The ice pricing uh, is uh, 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 in, a, in a solid territory. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. And uh, we continue with uh, George Gaillet from Goldman Sachs. Yes, good morning, and thank you for taking my questions. Um, the first question I had, which was a little bit related to um, Tim's question, was just with respect to the drop in wholesales that we saw in Q1. Obviously, if we compare that to the run rate of the prior three quarters, it looks like you had around a 60,000, 50 to 60,000 unit drop. Could you just help sort of break down um, what the buckets are there in terms of how much of that is E-class changeover, how much of that is maybe due to um, demand dynamics, and how much of it is a result of the supply chain constraints that you flagged. And then the second question I had was a more general question. One of your peers at their full year results called for a comprehensive review of EU fleet CO2 legislation. Do you share the view that this should be revisited? And would a change in legis legislation actually prove economically a net benefit for you given the ongoing investment in battery electric vehicles at this point in time? Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, George. Uh, well, I would, I would say uh, in terms of the, uh, the volume drop in the first quarter uh, compared to previous year and compared to where we want to be on a full year basis, uh, product availability is still, I mean, the number one in terms of uh, uh, volume size, um, and that refers, I mean, a lot uh, to e-class availability. Uh, number two, I would say, is then uh, the product uh, transitioning uh, in in various segments, but in particular on, on the top end side. And uh, number three, I think, all in all, uh, is some some softness on the on the market in the top end, I mean, in in China and maybe also a bit in in overseas. So, so that's uh, the ranking. How I would uh, see it, you can read uh, from the confirmation of the full year sales guidance. I mean, uh, <clears throat> uh, that obviously we do expect uh, uh, to overcome.
overcome that uh, quarter one situation, uh, as I just uh, commented before, following I mean, Tim's question already, I mean, with uh, quarter two sales uh, being up and then uh, further progression in, in age uh, two. Your second question in terms of revisiting uh, CO2 uh, legislation, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there is a, a juncture in uh, 2025 at the EU level to see whether uh, where the EV penetration stands uh, with regard to the 2035 uh, ICE ban. Uh, I think that, I mean, that probably makes perfect sense uh, in order to see whether the customer demand uh, is there to support the transitioning as initially in, envisaged, therefore taking a pragmatic view. Uh, I think we, uh, we support that perspective. Uh, however, let me say at the same time, is, uh, uh, <clears throat> we, we start to be a bit uh, too nervous uh, and I think, I mean, uh, too much on the, on the back foot uh, in terms of EV transitioning in these days. It remains our objective uh, to go electric. Uh, it remains our objective to go CO2 neutral, um, and uh, therefore I think uh, keeping ambitious targets also in terms of uh, EV transitioning is uh, what we globally support uh, in line with uh, our strategy. Thank you, George, and we, Thanks, George. And we continue with uh, Stephen Reitman from Bernstein Société Générale. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, could you have some more comments, please, on what you, how you see the market in China developing? Uh, you mentioned that the E-Class has been very well received. Can you talk also about the general environment you're seeing, both on ICE and the, your, for your BEVs in terms of um, uh, incentive activity and um, your, your pricing level there, please? Uh, yeah, thanks, Stephen. So uh, if we zoom a bit uh, more in depth on, on the China market, <clears throat> um, uh, number one, availability uh, on, on ECAS, as I emphasized. Uh, so once, uh, I mean, that is coming up, uh, we can see a demand, I mean, for the product also at healthy pricing level. Uh, we clearly see uh, a very strong uh, field of competitors and uh, product availabilities in the EV space. Um, um, I think uh, many of you were in in Beijing I mean, last week on the on the show. Uh, so uh, definitely uh, a very strong supply of uh, products. I mean, in the EV space, um, and um, uh, we positioned ourselves here. I mean, on the EV side, but as you can see also from the numbers, uh, we're not artificially pressing or trying to buy a share. Uh, with the products on the EV space, I mean, uh, in China. So we are rather leveraging I mean, uh, the, I mean, uh, the, the products where we feel uh, intrinsic I mean, customer demand, uh, as, uh, as just outlined before. And the number three, I would mention that globally, given the macro evolution I mean, in China and still, I think, some lack of um, consumer Comfort and uh, given the consumer sentiment, uh, we, we see the dynamics of the market uh, still being at a slower pace, including the top end uh, segment, uh, which also I mean, uh, leaves some traces in the first quarter and uh, probably also for the, for, the, for the full year. However, this is not related, I think, to our products, as uh, we see I mean, that our products in the top end space, in particular, I mean, the S class, remain absolutely market leader. Uh, not only in China, but in all, all of the markets, uh, but that is this, I mean, evolution which hits, I mean, uh, also uh, top end globally. So that's what I would say roughly in terms of the dynamics uh, on the China market. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, the next gentleman in line is Jose Asimendi from JP Morgan. Thank you very much. Jose Asimendi, good morning, Harold. Just a couple of questions, please. Uh, the first one, can you uh, uh, please quantify how many units did you sell, did you, did you miss in terms of deliveries uh, in Q1 for Mercedes-Benz cars due to the uh, supply of bottlenecks? Uh, and can you uh, maybe just give us a few more examples of uh, why you think these bottlenecks are easing into the second quarter? Is this something that you already see in Q2? It looks like the topic has been lagging for a couple of quarters. So any, any anecdotes you have on those bottlenecks easing, that would be, be great. 
And then second, can you comment a bit on your share of electric cars in, in China? So zooming into China, how do you think about the power train mixing in, in the region? We're seeing one of the competitors has a higher share of best, a quite high share of best um, in, in China. Um, do, you, do you plan to, to increase the share of uh, electric vehicles uh, in your Chinese sales in the coming quarters, or do you plan to keep it stable in 2024 versus 2023? Thank you. Yeah, on your, your first question, Jose, I mean, as, uh, as just commented before, uh, the, the sales of the volume impact in the first quarter, I mean, the most important uh, uh, in there was the product, I mean, availability given the supply constraints and uh, what, uh, again, mentioned E-Class uh, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, – uh, given the unit sales being the, the most impacted area still uh, in the in the first quarter. <clears throat> On the other side, you could see, I mean, with the GLC availability, that this is coming up, which gives, I think, confidence that once availability on e cars is there, uh, that we also see this one uh, uh, improving in uh, in the quarters minute to come. In terms of the EV share, is uh, just uh, commented, uh, we uh, uh, we follow in customer demand. Uh, we're not uh, uh, pushing excessively. I mean uh, the the products I mean here in into the market. Uh, we want to protect. I mean the product substance. We also protect. Uh, want to protect margin, um, uh, and that's why I would say we rather see an EV share uh, globally. Uh, which this year, which is rather stable at uh, 19 to 21 uh, percent, that also applies, uh, I would say, uh, for the, the market of the EVs I mean, in China. But uh, this is a very important point. Uh, let me take the opportunity of your of your question uh, to go beyond the quarter. Um, uh, we we are in a situation right now where we do not have EV offerings in all important segments of, of the market. Um, uh, here I look very much into 2025 and then further into 2026 uh, when uh, MMA comes to market, um, which obviously will have a much larger, larger, much broader offering in terms of EV vehicles in the entry segment. And then I'm looking very much to electric C-Class and GLC 2026 to come to market. Uh, which obviously is the area where we see most of the EV growth in these days. Uh, uh, where, I mean, given the, the life cycle evolution of EQC, which we, we commented I mean, earlier in the, in the call, uh, we don't have a product offering at this juncture. Um, so that explains, I would say, why you see different dynamics also in terms of EV evolution between uh, market participants. Uh, at our end, this is a function of uh, product availability, um, and uh, the products which are to come, MNA, MMA and uh, C-Class and GLC Electric, uh, we are very confident that they are going to meet uh, customer expectations uh, towards I mean, Mercedes products in the years 2025 and 2026. And therefore, I mean, we're going to build a curve on the EV share, not only in China, but also in, uh, in the rest of the world with these products to come. I think this is very important that we have a good understanding in terms of the product sequences. Um, uh, and here uh, uh, there is really good stuff, and many of you have seen the products um, and I think uh, share our belief uh, that they are going to make a difference in the market. Thank you so much. Very clear. Thanks, Jose. Um, we continue with uh, Philippe Rouchois from Jeffries. Um, yes, good morning. Thank you for um, letting me ask a question. Um, uh, my question is on R&D. There was a nice tailwind to the Q1 performance, and I'm just trying to understand how much of that is you know, seasonal weakness that will kind of normalize back. And also in the broader context, as we look at potentially the industry having to manage a longer transition to, um, to EVs than initially thought, um, to what extent there's a need to reinvest in the, um, a, a longer lifespan for ICE. And also, as you know, many of us were in China last week, and we see that, that interest in, in plug-in hybrids um, in the U.S. and in China and the return or the expansion of the uh, range extenders. 
and any thoughts that um, the need within the, the, the Mercedes uh, portfolio to consider range extenders as, again, uh, a longer transition into, uh, into a world of best. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Uh, absolutely, you're right. I mean, uh, uh, on the on the plugins, I think uh, they can play uh, a very important role in many markets in terms of I mean, the uh, the transitioning. Uh, I would dare to say that probably we have, I mean, uh, the <clears throat> the richest, the broadest, uh, the most versatile, uh, the most useful portfolio of plugins. I mean, in the market uh, with. Uh, uh, autonomy with a range of 100, 130 kilometers autonomy. Uh, so you can do basically most of the missions a week uh, on a fully electric basis, but then once you need the range, um, uh, you have the, uh, the combustion engine to take you further. Um, uh, we can see also in the, in the quarter one that the, the plug-in share I mean, is at a bit of higher level uh, than in previous uh, quarters. Um, the products are there. Uh, so it's not that we need to invest R&D into it. So they are they are ready to hit the street. Uh, so I think this is a, a, a jewel in the in the toolbox uh, which we can uh, leverage, and we're happy uh, if uh, the market demand uh, supports that. Uh, uh, not only China, in, but in uh, in many other markets, US as well, um, in in the future <coughs> as we go through this uh, transitioning. In terms of the investments uh, for the EVs. Let me be very clear, we do not slow down the investments on the EV side, uh, despite uh, some doubts in terms of uh, the pace of transitioning. Um, uh, we don't take a tactical approach here. No, we keep uh, the strategic focus in terms of investing into the EV products. Uh, I commented before on MMA in 2025, on uh, GLC and C-Class in 2026, but uh, obviously more stuff to come I mean, thereafter. So uh, we, uh, we stay full throttle on in terms of uh, the investment uh, on the EV side. And uh, <clears throat> also on the I side, um, we, uh, we do a lot uh, to uh, keep the products, I mean, at the, at the cutting edge. Uh, in the quarter one bridge, uh, I also said that we invest into, into measures uh, to uh, uh, further improve cutting edge technology and content in, in the vehicles, not only for new vehicles, but uh, over, over the life cycle. So uh, the ICE portfolio, which is in the market, um, uh, has, uh, has a great future um, and therefore can support uh, with healthy margins. Overall, uh, well, what you can see in the quarter one, I would not uh, take it times four. Uh, in terms of full year R&D and uh, investments, a bit of phasing uh, as always on the R&D side. And you can see a bit uh, as well, I mean, that uh, we are prioritizing the investments. Uh, not each and every uh, idea being brought forward uh, is, uh, is being passed. So uh, uh, despite uh, the, the focus uh, on uh, EV uh, investments uh, on uh, technology investments, software, MBOS, uh, drivetrain. Uh, however, we prioritize, and that's what you also see in in the numbers. Uh, with this, uh, in, on the on the margin side, but also on the cash flow side, if you look into the into the first quarter. So these are, I think, I mean, the elements at work. Great, thank you. Thanks, Philip. And the next gentleman in line is Henning Kosman from Barclays. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Thanks for taking the question. I had a couple of questions on, on price increase. Um, firstly, if you could remind us if in the net pricing you include the um, residuals or the remarketing gains and the year-over-year -year change of that, and um, uh, if you could remind us how this is trending and how you see this developing in the course of the year, if you could perhaps give us the um, euro-million impact in the first quarter and how you see it trending in the course of the year. And then the, the second part of the pricing question is, if you could, again, help us reconcile um, the pricing and how it's holding up for you. And you said you see it holding up for yourself. And I'm always trying to reconcile that with the headline discounts that we're seeing in the market, not only in China, but also in the U.S., where we get this third-party data. It doesn't seem to reconcile with the, the strong pricing that you're continuing to enjoy. So if you could please help us understand, again, is this a function of um, – List price is uh, still improving for you, and net-net, and despite higher discounts, that's still stable, or is there 
the part that the dealers are currently still digesting and how you think about the sustainability of that element? Um, or might you have to start digesting a bit more of the um, discount yourself in, in the course of the year and into next year? Thank you very much. Thanks, Henning. Uh, on the first question, uh, with regard to the remarketing used car business, uh, as we guided for uh, uh, in the full year guidance in February, we do see uh, some softening on, on the used cars, which is included in the uh, volume uh, structure pricing bucket on the, on the EBIT walk. Um, however, uh, not in the commentary on the on the pricing uh, where we said pricing stable. So uh, uh, you can rather I mean allocate that to structure or uh, <coughs> or so. In terms of what uh, what is the evolution I mean in the um, uh, in uh, the expected uh, evolution I mean in uh, 2024. So we ended 2023 with a pretty decent uh, uh, situation, I would say, in terms of uh, the. Uh, uh, the use card of the marketing results still being in the four-digit territory, um, in the low four-digit territory, um, <clears throat> higher than what uh, we initially thought. Uh, however, we do expect, I mean, some some softening. Part of which we could see in the in the first quarter some further uh, softening. We do anticipate at this juncture, I mean, for the remainder of the year. Which should still leave us, I mean, uh, with a healthy uh, three, three digit, mid to mid to high three digit uh, million remarketing result in the full year 2024. I, I hope that explains a bit, I mean, the, the building blocks, I mean, on, on that element. In terms of uh, the second question, uh, the pricing dynamics, uh, uh, why are we saying that, I mean, uh, pricing has been kept stable in the first quarter? Um, clearly, this is, I mean, the sum of uh, 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 new pricing um, for, for vehicles to come to, to market. So the MSRP evolution, including year-on-year -year escalation update, and the discount evolution on the other side. So we continued uh, our Pillar 2 strategy, um, value over volume, uh, in terms of uh, product positioning uh, on the MSRP side. We used some flexibility, I mean, here and there, I mean, uh, on, uh, on commercial measures uh, to stay tactically com competitive, and the sum of the two is, is, a, net, is a net positive. Uh, let me, let me uh, say as, at the same time, however, as you, all, you guys obviously spot each and every movement and each and every discount the dealer is giving on an on a individual vehicle, um, uh, we, at the end of uh, 2023, but also into I mean, quarter one, uh, we had uh, some stock uh, measures and st stock clearances, so to say, cleansing, which has been done uh, I mean, uh, by dealers, um, uh, and that I mean, uh, yielded I mean, some, some higher level discounts, I would say in particular I mean, on the EV side, um, and uh, we, we look at that very carefully. Uh, and then uh, we, we take respective I mean, conclusions in terms of how much supply is healthy, how much supply can be digested uh, or is, is, uh, is demanded by customers uh, in view of the stock at dealer, stock at our end, and uh, then if need be, we, we do adjust. So, uh, therefore, I mean, uh, <clears throat> I do expect that some of these uh, measures you, you did observe um, um, should not be with us for the remainder uh, of, the, of the year. Uh, on the ice side, uh, overall, I mean, the pricing uh, uh, is at a, at a more comfortable level, at a healthier level than on the EV side. Thank you. Thanks, Henning. And uh, we conclude the Q&A with Horst Schneider from Bank of America. Yeah, thank you. you. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, I just have got some smaller items left in terms of questions. What I'm observing basically for a while is that your interest income gets pretty strong. Um, so the run rate that we are seeing basically since Q4, um, can we extrapolate that now for the next few quarters? That we have a kind of 150 million euro positive um, uh, net interest income. Um, the number two that I have is related to the um, 
to the bridge items, uh, foreign exchange, and also industrial performance. However, as you said, industrial performance is going to remain strong, so we can expect for the next few quarters that we see an even better number that we did in Q1. Is that right? And in uh, terms of F, uh, foreign exchange burden, is that something that will now carry through the year, or that is something which will peter out maybe in the next few quarters? Uh, thanks, Horst. Uh, so the credit in terms of the improved interest rate results, I mean, I'm happy to pass it to Stefan, managing that uh, with his treasury head. Um, uh, but uh, maybe not at 150 million run rate a quarter. Uh, it would take it slightly down, if I, I would say. Uh, maybe still in the in the three-digit territory, but just at the beginning of it. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, he's nodding with a hat, so it suggests, I mean, that, that, that is a close to, to true statement. Um, on uh, the other items, uh, FX, uh, frankly, is a bit too difficult, I would say, uh, to predict. I'm, I'm not uh, claiming uh, to have a crystal ball in front of me in terms of uh, the, uh, the key currencies evolution. What we do observe, however, now since a while, is the evolution of the Turkish lira. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, this is still in constituting some uh, some headwind, uh, um, which we try to offset on on pricing side. Goes without saying. Uh, thanks to remind us on the industrial performance. As uh, I mean, this is really the name of the game in terms of the effort of the teams in all areas um, in supply chain management. Uh, try to materialize cash in uh, the raw material I mean evolution which uh, should be further beneficial I mean as we go through the year uh, it is uh, the effort of the teams um, to mitigate uh, minimize uh, uh, claims coming through the supply chain in terms of uh, inflation uh, claims or, or capacity related claims uh, here I still see some uh, further uh, headwind, I mean, on, on these uh, kind of uh, one-off claims, uh, but trying also to, to leverage uh, a, I mean, commercial and technical efficiency in the supply chain. Uh, so an extra effort, I mean, has been set up here um, by uh, the, the purchasing teams uh, to extract uh, more value, uh, not necessarily saying, I mean, cash out of the supply chain, but more value out of the supply chain. Um, so it's, it's really, I mean, a, a gigantic effort, um, which all in all, on um, the material cost uh, of uh, the, 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 the vehicles of the products, I mean, should provide us uh, some further tailwind as we go through the year. But not limited to the supply chain, obviously also in, in our operational field and environment, uh, uh, we, we took a quite significant operational objectives in terms of uh, further HPV evolution, efficiency gains, uh, fixed cost reduction uh, in, in operations um, to um, uh, drive uh, efficiencies of all the factories and, uh, and, uh, and the whole company. So altogether, uh, these uh, uh, efforts in terms of um, efficiencies, be it supply chain, uh, be it uh, operations I mean, internally uh, should provide us uh, with a tailwind for the quarters to come. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Horst. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, thanks a lot for your questions, for being with us today. We know it's a busy day for you as well. Also, thank you very much to Harold for answering the questions. As always, IR remains at your disposal to discuss further topics. Have a great morning, great afternoon, and great evening. Thank you very much, and goodbye.